And it looks like we've got a good 25 to 30 people with us so far, which is great. And I'm sure we'll get some more uh, people as we go as we get going. Um, Michelle, I'm going to turn it over to you to get us started whenever you're ready. Great. Um, so as Krista mentioned, she turned on the recording. We're going to be recording this to post for people who couldn't make it. We realized we weren't able to give a lot of notice. Um, but we're really glad for those of you who could be here. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I am Michelle Bedard Gilligan. I'm an associate professor in the University of Washington Department of Psychiatry. Um, and I do a lot of work on trauma recovery and responses to traumatic events. I'm here along with um, Kristen Lindgren, who's a professor, um, also a clinical psychologist here in the Department of um, Psychiatry, and Emily Dworkin, who's an acting assistant professor in the Department of Psychiatry as well, also a psychologist. Um, so the three of us are really excited to be here to talk with you about psychological first aid, um, which is an evidence-informed approach to um, working with individuals who are um, either in the acute aftermath or currently being exposed to trauma. Um, before we get started, we want to go ahead and thank um, the, various, the various organizations and people who really helped us put this together. Um, as you can imagine, with the speed with which this crisis is developing, um, we had to put this together quite quickly. And so we had to rely on the support of a whole lot of different um, people and um, uh, organizations. And so these materials are based on and, heavily, and adapted from um, existing resources that are out there from the World Health Organization. Organization, um, the National Child Traumatic Stress Network, um, and then we also relied heavily on materials that were developed by our colleague and friend, Dr. Deborah Kaysen, who's down at Stanford University as well. Um, we also want to thank the people here at the UW who made this possible. Um, this was truly a, a huge team effort, um, and we can't be more grateful to the Department of Psychiatry um, for really supporting us in putting this together, both um, by providing some funding for it, as well as giving us sort of the the um, logistical support we needed and uh, always the emotional support as well <laughs> as, we, as we took on this undertaking. Um, uh, the UW COVID-19 Mental Health Working Group, which is um, comprised of individuals at Harborview and UW who are really working on how we can um, disseminate things around wellness um, related to this crisis to our staff and our employees and our faculty. Um, and they had a lot of input in the, um, on this as well. And then finally, we have to acknowledge Molly Forrester, Rebecca Sladek, and Ro Rosemary Whitwright by name um, because they put quite a bit of time and energy and resources into helping us with getting things together, developing materials, and all things tech related, <laughs> which we could not be more grateful for. So, um, okay, so we are here to talk about psychological first aid, um, and we're going to give you sort of the high level overview and the brief description um, of psychological first aid, what it is, and um, and when you use it um, and why we use it. So we'll start with sort of why we use it, why, why it is that we focus on acute interventions um, during and after traumatic events, um, what PFA is, um, what it's designed to do, um, and then talk a bit about when and who it's appropriate for. Um, and then finally, since spend a big chunk of time on the how. So how we deliver it, how we, um, and kind of strategies and tips for doing PFA or psychological first aid. Um, I also forgot to mention, so I'm gonna stop here for a second, that we are happy to take questions questions throughout. We're going to encourage people to use the chat function to send in questions. Um, Emily um, has offered to moderate this, so if you can send in questions throughout. Um, anything that comes to mind that you're interested in knowing about, go ahead and chat it up. <laughs> send it through the chat function and Emily will monitor it. Um, if it seems like something that um, needs to be asked right away, she'll go ahead and stop Kristen and I and we'll, we'll address it in real time. Otherwise, she's going to sort of gather them all and um, Kind of categorize them and we'll we'll get to them at the end. We're going to save at least 10 or 15 minutes at the end just to go over questions. Um, so please feel free to send those in as we go um, or you can save them to the end and we'll have you send them in through the chat function then. So. Okay, so psychological first aid, the why. So what, why is it that we are putting so much focus on sort of these acute interventions? Um, and so it, it helps to start talking about it by really framing it in, in, in the framework or really thinking about it um, uh, 
as thinking about it in the framework of resilience. Um, so we know that humans have an unbelievable ability to be resilient. Um, so basically an unbelievable ability to adapt well, even in, in the face of really horrific and challenging things, even in the face of really significant stress. And we know that this resilience is actually considered pretty ordinary. Um, it is the most common outcome um, following really traumatic and difficult experiences. So we don't consider it an extraordinary superpower. Um, being resilient, that ability to continue to move forward, even when terrible things happen, um, is really quite common and widespread. Um, and being resilient does not mean that there are no reactions. So that does not mean that we're not seeing stress reactions. It doesn't mean that we're not hearing people express difficulties with coping. Um, it just means that people are able to get through um, and continue to function and move forward in a way that's meaningful and and adaptive for them. Um, what we also know that resilience is not a trait. It's something that can be learned, um, something that can be acquired. Um, and that's where something like PFA that we're gonna be talking about today really comes in, is this idea of what can we do to build resilience um, so that people are more likely to be able to follow that path forward. Um, and resilience can take a lot of different shapes and forms. It's not going to look the same for everybody. And the pathway to resilience is not going to look the same for everybody. Um, but we're going to see ups and downs in terms of how people cope with stressors, um, particularly when we're in the midst of the kind of stressor that we're in right now, which is really sort of a chronic state of elevated distress and elevated um, str stressful circumstances that's punctuated by these acute periods of even more stress, right? Um, and what we're talking a lot about today is PFA for healthcare workers. So PFA for those individuals who are really at the front lines of this crisis. Um, and when we think about psychological first aid for them, we really th have to think about what that path is gonna look like. Um, so they are in this state of heightened alert where they're preparing for all the things this crisis is going to bring. And that is sort of punctuated by these, these weeks, these days or weeks or hours of these really acute stressors where they're seeing really terrible things in the line of their work that maybe they're not as used to seeing on such a regular basis. Um, and we have heard a lot recently about how we are starting to flatten, flatten our curve, how things are starting to get better, or starting to be more stable. And we actually think that when we think about resilience, what we might see is as we are doing that, as things are somewhat flattening out, this might be about the time that we're going to start to see some really strong emotional reactions come out in individuals who are really heavily exposed. They've been going a mile a minute. They've been doing everything they can to survive um, and just get through the workday. They're learning new things. They're putting out fires. Um, and if things, when things start to calm down is when they're going to start to really start to process and think through what they've been exposed to and the things that they've seen and the things that they've lived through. Um, and so really, these kinds of coping strategies to build resilience are probably going to be most needed over the next kind of weeks as you know we have we have hopefully peaked um, but that means we still have a way to go um, in terms of coming down on the other side of that curve and we know that there's certain things that are going to put some individuals more at risk for having difficulties coping um, difficulties pulling on kind of that inner resilience that most of us have kind of ingrained in us, things that are going to make it harder. Um, and some of those things are what we call situational risk factors. So these are the things that are happening sort of in the moments of exposure. So certainly the severity of event. So those healthcare workers or other individuals who are really being exposed to the worst of the worst. So those that are on the COVID units, those are that are in the ICU intubating patients on a regular basis. Um, those who have unfortunately observed patients die um, or been exposed themselves. Um, these are kind of the markers of severity in this particular crisis um, that's going to make people more at risk for having trouble being resilient on their own. Um, in addition, that can be combined with things going on in their personal life, so life stress that's going on. So if they're also dealing with family members or friends who are ill, um, they're you know, like many of us trying to figure out childcare and financial concerns and other things that as well as go to work on these front lines every day. Um, and then the amount of social support that they may or may not be getting from those around them. So for various reasons, right? Um, but everything from, you know, partners who are limited in their ability to provide support to, um, you know, being surrounded by family or friends who are, who are not um, particularly happy with the way we're responding to the pandemic. And, you know, those are the kinds of things in their social world that can put people at risk. Um, for being less resilient. 
we also think that what someone comes into a stressful situation with is also going to be a risk, could potentially be a risk factor. So individuals who were coming into this pandemic, having had previous experiences of past trauma um, and maybe haven't um, completely dealt with that, um, individuals who had pre-existing mental health problems, so anxiety or depression, um, this is li that's li likely to be exacerbated by the current crisis and potentially could put them kind of more at risk for not being quite as resilient, um, or individuals who had been relying on kind of maladaptive coping strategies as well. Um, you know, again, that could be exacerbated. And so these are some of the individuals that we think are going to be most um, kind of at, these are the things that put people sort of most at risk um, for not coping quite as well during a stressful experience like our current pandemic. Um, but we, ought, we really know that what happens during sort of the acute phase um, matters for who recovers. So I started by saying that most of us are, are really built to be resilient, and that is very true. Um, but we also know that what happens during acute and chronic stress experiences does make a difference. It makes a big difference um, for who follows those resilience trajectories, who is able to keep moving forward, um, and who gets stuck and has a kind of more, um, more negative long-term trajectory. Um, and that's where PFA really comes in. So psychological first aid is an approach that is really um, designed to be a humane and supportive response to someone suffering. Um, basically, it is a way of responding um, in the midst of a crisis that we think is a, a way of helping someone kind of harness or build their inner resilience. So really being able to bring coping skills that are gonna be effective in helping them move forward to the forefront. Um, and so it's meant to be an acute intervention um, that is hopefully designed to sort of reduce some of the initial distress around traumatic events. Um, and then, like I said, help build some of those things that we think can make people more resilient. Um, so by increasing their sense of safety, um, their feelings of connection, um, by increasing access to different types of support um, that they might be able to rely on, um, as well as increasing self-efficacy. So helping them to view their ability to cope as positive um, in order to help them sort of be, um, be able to do that kind of forward path. Um, and it's evidence informed. So PFA is based on strategies that we know from prior research um, are effective in kind of doing all these things that we we're talking about. And it really does have several, it's characterized by several core themes. Um, it's about kind of practical care and support um, that's designed to be non-intrusive. Non it's designed to meet the person where they're at. Um, and some of the themes that we're going to talk about in detail are really these ideas about communicating in a way that's supportive, um, listening um, when people want to share and encouraging people to share what feels comfortable to them, providing accurate information um, to help them kind of get a sense of, of where this crisis is at and, and what they need, um, teaching um, kind of coping skills to help people cope in as adaptive ways as possible. Um, and this can include things like managing strong emotions, so short-term strategies for that, um, as well as connecting people with services and social supports um, so that they have what they need to go forward um, through the crisis and beyond. And it's important to note that PFA is different from traditional therapy. Um, so it is not therapy. It does not look like what many of us are used to providing in a standard therapy setting. Um, it doesn't follow a typical therapy structure. Um, it's not the time or place to uh, work on things like interpretations or um, dig into kind of past learning experiences. Um, it's often not even the time to really get into details of the traumatic event itself. It sort of depends on the person and where they're at. Um, but yeah, as we'll talk about later, um, but it is not the kind of standard therapy that many of us are used to doing. It's, it's meant to be um, supportive, short-term skill building um, to increase resilience. And then I think it's important to note that PFA is not psychological debriefing. So psychological debriefing is something that many of us are probably familiar with um, and, and probably don't have the best um, associations around. Um, and PFA differs from something like psychological debriefing in a lot of ways. So psychological debriefing was really built on this notion that everybody needed intervention during and after stressful events, um, and that that intervention really had to be focused on going through the experience in detail and processing the emotions around it. Um, and PFA differs from that in several ways, um, most, most notably in this idea that not everybody will 
necessarily need the same thing. Um, so it's very much not a one size fits all approach. Um, and it doesn't put the focus on really digging into those emotions so much as learning good coping skills to move forward. So some of the general guidelines around PFA, um, it really is meant to be done in kind of a framework of, a, of an organized response system. So here at the UW, we're trying to build up PFA as part of the COVID support program that we're running, um, but it's just as well in terms of how, it, as part of how the medical center as a community is responding to those affected by COVID. Um, other things about PFA, um, it is, um, in, you know, in terms of confidentiality, that is something that it does have in common with traditional therapy. There's an emphasis on sort of maintaining confidentiality, um, respecting um, individuals' rights to make their own well-informed decisions, um, as well as being culturally sensitive and aware about what might work for a given individual. Um, there's an emphasis on really staying within your scope of expertise, the role you have in the training. So this comes into play quite a bit um, in this particular crisis where we're thinking about um, dealing with you know a, a medical crisis where many of us may not have the training in kind of the, the medical aspects of the of, of COVID or the sort of medical aspects that go into caring for patients with COVID and so really respecting the limits around what we do and don't know and then our role as a support person um, for frontline healthcare workers and what that is really supposed to be um, in terms of what we are providing and not providing. Um, and then finally, there's an, you know, putting the emphasis on yourself as well. So being able to practice self-care and be aware of your own physical and emotional reactions and how that might affect how you interact with someone. Um, because this crisis is happening to all of us. Um, and when we deliver PFA, that is often the case that we're all living in the midst of a crisis. Um, and so we have to be aware of how it's affecting us um, and, and be careful of how that could, you know, um, affect how we provide care. And PFA is really designed to be delivered either during or in the immediate aftermath of a mass disaster. So it is, um, has been very effectively implemented um, after things like mass shootings, after things like natural disasters. Um, but it also is, you know, it, it's done in the context of those ongoing, those events still being ongoing. So, you know, when we think about it being done in the context of an earthquake, even though the ground has stopped shaking, the consequences of that earthquake are still going on and PFA is delivered to the individuals that are being you know in the moment affected by that. Um, it also has been used very effectively in um, pandemics in the past, um, not most notably Ebola, um, where PFA was heavily relied on to provide support to those affected by the Ebola crisis. Um, and PFA really is kind of appropriate or is a really good fit to be the framework for the support calls that we're providing um, as part of our support program. Um, because we are, the goal and the intention is to do those support calls now while, the, while people are in the midst of the crisis and are going to work every day still affected by the crisis. And so PFA is a really um, appropriate or good fit um, for the COVID support program in particular. Um, the, when we think of who delivers PFA and who benefits from PFA, one of the things that makes PFA a really appealing, appealing option um, is that it is um, easily, it's relatively easily disseminable. So it does not necessarily require a mental health specialist for delivery. Um, so you do not necessarily need to have a mental health background in order to provide PFA. And we are actually thinking about, um, everyone on this call probably does have a mental health background, but we are thinking about how we um, might be able to roll this out to, to be provided by individuals who don't have the training that we all have. Um, it does require some training in PFA, um, and that's because it is, a, it is a specific approach with very specific strategies. And so there is a need to be familiar with the framework and, the, and what PFA looks like before doing it, um, as well as, as I mentioned earlier, having met your own needs before you go on to do to provide PFA. In terms of who benefits from PFA, um, most important is that it is, they are individuals who are expressing interest in support or stabilization. So as I mentioned, it is not psychological debriefing where we are assuming everybody needs this intervention following the stressor. And so the most important thing is that the individuals who are receiving it are those who are 
are seeking out some kind of support or stabilization services. Um, and then PFA, we really think about wanting to implement it with those that we think are the highest risk for developing negative outcomes. So some of those risk factors I talked about before. Um, so the individuals on the front line who are getting a bigger dose of this crisis, for example, um, because of their proximity to it. Um, these are the people for whom we think PFA is probably um, the most appropriate. Um, and there are going to be times um, when you're delivering PFA, as I mentioned, it is not typical therapy, and there are going to be times where you're delivering it um, where you may have to take a step back. So there are going to be situations where people need more than PFA can provide, and an explicit goal of PFA is to connect those people um, with the services that they might benefit from. And so knowing your own limits, um, either as a provider or of the role that you're in, um, and then knowing when and where to refer is kind of a crucial aspect of, of doing PFA well. Um, and when we think about the healthcare workers that we're likely to see, particularly as part of this COVID support program, um, uh, we can think about a lot of different ways that we're gonna see effects of this crisis on them. Um, and things like high workload and increased stress, um, having to deal with possible loss of coworkers or patients, um, anxiety about their coworkers, their patients, and their families, um, distress about how to prioritize or allocate care. We can think about a lot of ways in which this crisis is going to be taking a toll on them, um, and a lot of ways in which PFA um, might be helpful in terms of um, helping them deal with these things um, and develop resilience. And so, what we're going to do now is actually transition, and Kristen's going to take over, and she's going to talk about the how. So, she's going to talk about what PFA they look like and how we do it to address um, the, the consequences that we're seeing on our healthcare workers. Great. Thanks, Michelle. Um, and uh, so delighted to have so many of you with us on the call today, especially on such short notice. We really appreciate it and really appreciate your support and your thoughts about um, also how we can improve this uh, in terms of as we develop materials to be able to train people. Because as Michelle said, um, this has been um, one heck of an accelerated timeline to try to put these things together and get them to you. Um, one thing that I want to kind of orient everybody to is in terms of typical PFA trainings, because PFA is not new, it's been around for a long time, and there are existing online trainings and there's existing manuals that are out there, and we're going to show you how you access those kind of resources at the end of the training today, is that those materials are typically really, really dense. So if you think about an online training, it's usually somewhere between six to 13 hours that that takes. And then when you think about um, uh, uh, the manuals, they're often about 100 and 30, 140 pages. And so we're trying to distill this out and give you an overview in about 45 minutes or less so that we have time for questions on that end. So this is gonna be big picture. Think about it as a primer more than anything else to get you oriented to what this looks like and how you might do it. So when we think about PFA, Michelle, if you can move to the next slide. Um, what we're gonna see in the model of PFA that we're presenting to you here is comprised of eight core actions. And so one thing to know is that there are multiple variants of PFA. We're basing our trainings and materials off of uh, the version that's been put forth by the National Centers for PTSD and the National Child Traumatic Stress Network. And what they do is they really frame PFA as a meeting, a session, um, a time that you spend with an individual that can comprise of eight core actions. And so that's the language you'll see from here going forward. And key things that I want to orient you to and have you take away from it is that these eight core actions, although I, we're gonna teach them to you in sequence, do not necessarily need to be done in sequence. And that the overarching idea behind PFA is that it is in fact flexible, that it is tailored, that it is individual, and that it's really based on the particular person that you're working with and meeting with and providing support for and their specific needs and concerns. Next slide. And so here is a list of those eight core actions, and you're going to see that a number of them are in bold. Technically, only two, three, six, and seven are in bold. Those are ones that we're going to highlight as we go forth uh, throughout uh, the remainder of the training. And these are ones in particular where training in mental health, for those of us who do have experience um, in mental health and we are mental health providers, you're going to see lots of skills that many of you probably use in your practice. And then some that are going to be new in the context of thinking about it for doing these kind of brief support interventions. Next slide. And so where PFA begins is it begins with the actions of contact and engagement and then moving into support and safety. And so what a PFA session or a meeting might look like, right, is 
beginning with simply getting to know the person, uh, building rapport, and then aiming over the time that you spend with that person to support their safety and their comfort. And so when we think about this, once you're in contact with somebody who's wanting support, the initial goal, just like a lot of the interactions that we typically do in our clinical work, is to build rapport, to make the person feel comfortable, to make it feel safe for them to share concerns that they might wish to share and get support for. And on our end, our job, if we're actually providing PFA, is to express and to demonstrate our willingness to help them problem solve around increasing feelings of safety for themselves and for their loved ones. And if we think about this in the context of COVID-19 and supporting safety, common issues that might come up um, might involve assessing the individual's concerns about their own exposure to COVID-19 and to helping them think through and make plans about limiting their own and other people's exposure. And as Michelle said, for many of us, this is a place where we're gonna have to walk a fine line because if we're not uh, individuals who have medical backgrounds, this is gonna look a little bit different than someone who might have more expertise with it. And a core theme with NPFA is that we don't overreach. We do what we know. We provide accurate, fact-based information. And if we don't know, then we say that we don't know, and that we go and we get advice, we get the information, and we relay it back. And so that's another key component of PFA. And a key focus that we want to have, right, is to really focus and emphasize what is doable right now. And for some individuals, it may be helpful to focus on what has worked for them in the past as a way to build towards what might be helpful in the current situation. Next slide. And the overarching goal um, for these first two core actions, and frankly, throughout an entire uh, PFA interaction, is in fact to use and to model good communication skills, right? And these kinds of skills are a typical mental health provider's bread and butter. This is what most of us seek to do in every interaction that we have with a client or a patient. And that's something that we also want to do when we're providing support to a peer. And our goal here is to provide a sense of calm, a sense of compassion, and a sense of, of respect, uh, both for the individual and for the culture that they're coming from. And throughout, what we're wanting to do as we're in communication with the person that we're providing support for is to be looking for opportunities. And the kind of opportunities we're looking for are we're looking for opportunities to allow the person to share what they've been going through if that's what they wish to do. Again, that's that critical difference between psychological debriefing and PFA. Some people are gonna wanna talk and ask you to kind of hold their experience and other people aren't. And either way is completely fine and we meet the person where they are. And the other thing that we're gonna be wanting to look for are opportunities to acknowledge or highlight the person's genuine existing strengths and their resilience. Next slide. As you might imagine, uh, providers who've been through a crisis event, our healthcare workers who have been exposed to a lot of complicated situations uh, in their work through the COVID crisis may end up having a lot of strong emotions. They may be very upset. They may be very anxious. They may be very confused. And so you as somebody providing support for them may actually see that they're experiencing a lot of stronger intense emotions. And so in the context of PFA and this larger goal of wanting to help individuals develop resilience and to use their coping skills, what we wanna do is really focus on ways to support their experience by helping the individuals that we're meeting with sit with their emotions and then also to help validate their emotions. And what you'll see on this slide is you'll see lots of examples of how you might do this in the context of grief. And certainly those same kind of strategies apply to other strong emotions too. And a key piece that I wanna highlight for you, which I think is important, whether it's grief or something else, is that our job in this situation, right, is not to take away the person's pain. We don't need to do that. What our job is to do is if they open up to us, is to let them give the space to have those feelings and to sit with those feelings with them. What I also wanna orient you to in terms of the slide deck is that you're gonna see that there are these pro tips that pop up periodically. And our goal with the slide deck, uh, someone asked a question earlier and Emily already responded, but we are making this available. Um, Emily's gonna walk through all the resources, but it's already been posted on a department website for you, is that this is something that you can go back to and to pull these pro tips out to the degree to which they're helpful for you. For some of you, you know all this already and you do this regularly. And for others of you, this is gonna be new. And so we want you to have this as a resource that you can take with you and to use what's useful and chuck the rest, okay? And Michelle, can you move to the next slide? Thanks. Um, 
We also want to give some considerations, right, when we're helping to support individual safety and comfort about the challenges that may come up in the context of COVID-19 and acute grief, right? And this is something that may affect the individuals that we're supporting and frankly is affecting all of us right now, right? And one of those things that we need to acknowledge is that many of our typical processes, rituals, supports that we have related to grief are not only interrupted, they're really disrupted right now, right? And so what we wanna think about and things that may be really helpful to the extent to which that's coming up for the individual that you're supporting and providing a, a PFA session or intervention is to both acknowledge and validate that those interruptions are in fact happening. And what can be helpful for individuals is to help them identify and brainstorm with them that are achievable ways that they can grieve in this context. And this is certainly something that we've seen in the context of PFA being applied uh, to Ebola and certainly is quite likely to come up here in the context of COVID. Michelle, with that, can you move me on? Okay. Uh, the third core action that comes up with PFA is stabilization. And when we're talking about stabilization, this is in context of you might be working with uh, someone who wanted help, who wanted support, who ends up having really intense emotions. It might be that they become extremely anxious, it might be that they become overwhelmed, or they might even shut down and become non-responsive or numb. And then in that moment when we're talking about stabilization, we're really thinking about acutely being able to help the person stabilize, uh, kind of regain their sense of self so that we can actually help them move forward, right? And so with that, I think it's important to acknowledge that this is likely to be a relatively small subset of individuals in the process of support calls, but it's not non-zero. And so we wanna make sure people have a good sense of stabilization skills that they can use. And what you're gonna see on the next slide uh, is another resource, uh, Michelle, if you wouldn't mind forwarding me over there, uh, that we have developed uh, for you. And Emily's gonna talk us through these in more detail when we get through um, the rest of the training, are a set of infographics, so one page, um, tips with information uh, related to a number of the PFA skills, including stabilization skills like grounding. And the first part of the infographic and the piece that we wanna help think through a little bit right now is some considerations about when it is that you might use grounding. And again, for those of you on the call, and it's gonna be the bulk of us on this call who are mental health care providers, we probably know a fair bit about grounding and we may even regularly use it in our practice. Um, but it certainly is a skill that you can use if somebody's having an acute response um, to give them a way to calm their body down, bring them in, um, and help them work through it. And so this is just a little yes-no process diagram to help you think through that. And then on our next slide, what you're going to see, thanks Michelle, um, is an actual set of explanations for a grounding skill that you can use. And again, given that the folks on this call are quite likely to have a mental health background, may use these things regularly, PFA is flexible. You do not have to use the grounding skill that you see here, but we wanna make sure that there's a grounding skill that's made available for you uh, that you can see and that you could use and refer back to. And so with this, this is a grounding skill that some of you may be familiar with that really emphasizes inviting the person to sit comfortably and breathe slowly and deeply. And as some of you may know, when you're doing breathing uh, for grounding, it's that long, slow exhale that really helps calm the body down and bring that nervous system back down to a set of calmness. And then after that, kind of going through this process of naming five non-distressing things you can see, five, and then pausing and breathing again, naming five non-distressing sounds you can hear, pausing and breathing again, and then naming five non-distressing things you can feel, pausing and breathing again. And so again, in that context of somebody having a really intense emotional reaction, a way to help them kind of come back into their body to calm that nervous system down, this is a skill that you can use. And of course, you're welcome to use other grounding skills that you may know already. Michelle, can you move me to the next slide? Great. PFA also includes core actions related to information gathering and practical assistance. Uh, for us as mental health providers, these kinds of core actions are likely to move us into uh, this active listening phase with an eye towards helping identify the immediate concerns and needs that the peer that we're supporting has, and really helping to work with that individual to develop a plan where we can prioritize those concerns and ultimately um, be able to leave them with and help them develop uh, an action plan that they can take with them. And again, just as a reminder, right throughout you're seeing with PFA, it's not one size fits all. 
And so what the person needs help with and what those corrections might be are gonna look quite different from person to person. For some people, it might be around, I just need somebody to sit and help me listen to what happened. And for other people, it might be, I need some brainstorming to figure out how I'm gonna sort out something related to childcare or how I'm gonna work out a safety issue or just, and not that our job or our role is to resolve that safety issue, but it might be around, how can I help this person come up with strategies about how to even make the request, right? And so these are the kinds of things that might come up along that core action. What you'll see on the next slide, if you can bring me there, Michelle, uh, is another one of the materials that we've developed for you, and we'll go through in more detail, um, is a formal problem-solving strategy. Again, for many of us uh, who practice clinically for mental health, we're used to using problem-solving skills and potentially uh, teaching them to our own clients and patients, but it's also something that you can use and incorporate in the context of PFA of helping and modeling problem solving and even leaving the person that you're working with a problem solving plan so that they have it and it's a skill that they can go back to and use in those moments when they get overwhelmed. And what you'll see here, right, is these kind of typical wonderful principles of problem solving, of assessing and prioritizing needs and concerns, right, focusing again on the most pressing controllable issues, brainstorming those solutions, thinking about pros and cons, and then coming up with an action plan and again, the spirit of collaboration that echoes throughout. Michelle, can you move me to the next slide? Thanks. Um, amidst the physical distancing that we're having to do with COVID-19 and the high workloads that so many of our healthcare workers are experiencing and the stress that they're experiencing related to that, I think one of the things to be aware of, right, is just how easy it can be for people to become socially isolated or withdrawn. And yet what we also know is that connection to social support are some of the key factors that can help us build resilience, right? These are things that can help us build well-being and recovery from acute stress. And so as a result of that, the sixth action, sixth core action that's part of PFA is in fact to help people uh, establish or reestablish social support. Michelle, can you move me to the next one? Thanks. Many of us are incredibly familiar with social support, so we didn't really want to take too much time on it, but we did want to just remind us all that um, there are many, many forms of social support. And here we've just got a list of a number of those. And we want to highlight that there are these many forms and that many of these forms are things that we might be looking for the person to do where people can help them. And that also a key part of social support for people can be about feeling needed and being able to help others and not to overlook that as well in the context of helping to facilitate social support. The next core action in PFA, uh, that's the second to last one, is coping. And this core action really focuses on specific strategies to help facilitate adaptive coping. And it really comprises two categories of things as I think about it. The first part is psychoeducation that comes up, right? And psychoeducation about these stress reactions that people are having and responses to the stressors that people are experiencing. And the second part is about brainstorming and working with the individual to think through practical coping strategies that can be helpful for them both in terms of reducing distress that they might be experiencing and also to help them promote adaptive uh, functioning. And you'll see at the bottom of the slide that big reminder, right, again, how tailored PFA is, that some of these things you might not even do within an, ind within an individual providing peer support, even though for many of us as mental health care providers, these are things that we would naturally do with clients. So again, this is where you're going to see that flexibility depending upon what the person needs and how you can be of help to them. Uh, next slide, Michelle. So what you're going to see, whole slide with a lot of information, again, this is intended to be a reference that you can go back to later, is a quick overview of common reactions to acute stressors, right? And this can be helpful uh, to give some psychoeducation to individuals about what might be happening for them and give them some context for what they might be experiencing while they're in the middle of this crisis. What you'll notice, many of you with familiarity in mental health, um, is that a lot of these things look like PTSD symptoms, and that's a reminder for us that what we think about as PTSD several months after a traumatic event, these are also the common reactions that we have in the immediate and the intermediate response to a traumatic event. Um, and with that, if we flip over to the next slide, it's important to help individuals 
realize that these kinds of reactions that you might have are natural, they're expected, and they're common, right? These reminders, these reactions that people might have are to be expected in the context of traumatic events in the matter of crises. And it's also important to provide some education that for most people, these experiences will actually get better over time. And what we wanna do is to help our individuals that we're supporting develop a plan to manage reminders if that's something for happening them, happening for them, to help them develop a plan to manage the losses and the life changes that are coming up. And again, when we talk about that, we're really thinking on a more practical level. We're not talking about exposure. We're not talking about really complex cognitive restructuring at that point in time. And a reminder for us all, the PFA really is one of these tip of the spear kinds of responses. It's that initial way to help someone and that most people are going to get better over time. And that for some people, they are going to have more trouble and they are going to struggle. And we're going to be thinking about places where we might intervene if those kinds of problems and symptoms and reactions are continuing after more than two months. And if the person is actually worsening and having impaired functioning. Michelle, can you move me to the next one? As mental health care providers, we're likely to be extremely well-versed in lots and lots and lots of different coping strategies. And so what we wanted to do with this slide was to give you some reminders about the many forms that those coping strategies can take. And in the context of PFA, again, the overarching principle that we have is we're looking to support the person in terms of restarting or establishing the helpful adaptive strategies that they have and to minimize their use of those unhelpful or maladaptive strategies that might be coming on. Next slide, Michelle. Common issues that can come up in some places uh, that we might think about in terms of helping someone, both in terms of providing psychoeducation and then some brief coping strategies are related to problems with sleep. And so here what we've got are just some quick and dirty tips about ways that you might briefly be able to help someone who's experiencing sleep-related concerns. Michelle, can you move me to the next one? And then on the next slide, uh, we know that problematic substance use can certainly occur in the context of acute stressors and crises, uh, particularly uh, using substances as a means to cope. And again, what we have here are some quick and dirty tips to be helpful with that. And again, our expectation is that um, for this community that's uh, largely consisting of mental health providers, these are uh, strategies that are likely to be quite familiar with you. And a key piece, right, is that this is this gentle checking in what are the positives and negatives, how to discuss their goals that might be coming up, uh, anticipating obstacles and supporting around that, and referring for treatment only if it's appropriate and desired for them. Michelle, do you mind moving me to the next one? We also wanna think a little bit about strong emotions that somebody might be, think, might be feeling like guilt, shame, or blame, and unhelpful thoughts that go along with that. We know that the meaning that people make of the experiences that they're having is really important. And if they're having those kinds of strong emotions or unhelpful thoughts, one of the things that we know is that gentle, curious questions, those of you uh, in the group may know them as Socratic questions, can be helpful to help a person get unstuck. And we've just thrown a couple examples up here to orient you to that. For example, thinking about what would your kind of self say about this? Are there other ways to look at the situation? Again, trying to teach some metacognition and shift people's thinking gently. Next slide. And finally, the last core action that comes up with PFA is about linking with other services, right? So PFA is not about needing to be anything and everything to the individual that you're supporting. It's providing the support that you can, helping to facilitate resilience and coping. And your job is also to help be a connector where you need to be. And so in order to be a connector, you do need to have a general sense of additional resources and services that are available. You need to know what's available or know who to ask and how to get to them. And you also wanna work collaboratively with the individual that you're supporting to figure out what are their priorities and how can you do it? And so from that standpoint, I think I'm delighted that Molly's here with us on the call today. Molly for me is a go-to resource. If questions come up, and I want to link, she's often for me a go-to link in this circumstance. And the final part of PFA is offering to follow and check in with the person. PFA can certainly be something that happens one time and only one time, and it can be appropriate, if indicated, uh, to follow up and check in and see how the person is doing. And with that, we'll move to the next slide. And so I've just taken you on a whirlwind tour of how to do PFA. And more than anything, what I wanna leave you with is that PFA can provide a framework for building resilience. 
And given that in order to be able to do PFA or any kind of crisis intervention successfully, we also have to be making sure that we are in a good place and taking care of ourselves is to also be thinking about and being mindful of the fact that we can apply PFA and the PFA strategies to ourselves for self-care. And with that, I'm gonna turn things over to Emily, who's gonna walk us through the various resources uh, around um, and that she's developed. Thank you, Kristen. So I wanted to orient you to a few different resources. Um, one is that there is a detailed online training for PFA that covers many of the same points that we outlined here. Uh, it's available through the National uh, Child Traumatic Stress Network, and we've included the link. There's also a great PFA skills training manual available through the National Center for PTSD. Um, and there's a mobile app also from the National Center. Uh, we also wanted to put a link for PTSD coach, um, which obviously is more oriented to um, psychopathology that's developed after a crisis has ended, but might be useful for people that are um, not exhibiting resilience over time. And then there's also some UW specific resources. Um, there is a shared online space through the, Depart or the School of Medicine that collects a lot of the resources um, that are available. Uh, we are going to be having a office hour on Mondays from 9 to 10 a.m. Uh, it's going to rotate between Kristen, Michelle, and I. Um, and we'll send more details about that over email, but generally that's intended to be a space for anybody who wants to come check in and get feedback or have questions answered about how to handle support calls to have a clinician that's available to do that. Um, and then finally, the psychiatry department has very kindly created a lovely website for us that includes a lot of um, some key materials that we think are useful in handling these calls, as well as some of the infographics that we've developed and the PDFs of, of the webinar slides and uh, once this is over the recording of the webinar. Um, so, Michelle, if you could advance, I'm going to show you some of the infographics that we created for um, this training specifically. So the first is a quick reference about some of the, the core strategies and, and core elements of psychological first aid. Um, the ones that Kristen went over earlier in the call. Um, so this should just be a review of those. And then if you wanna advance again, Michelle. The second is an infographic about grounding that includes the decision aid about when grounding is or is not appropriate. And then how to practice grounding as well. And then if you could advance. There's also a infographic about helping people cope that includes the problem solving steps and um, cues to what healthy coping is and is not. And then finally, if you could advance one more time, Michelle, we created a quick reference guide uh, that on the first page includes a support session outline that you could use for your phone sessions, incorporating the different skills of PFA. And then on the back, it collects a lot of the materials from the other infographics I just showed you all in one handy um, reference guide. And I think that that is it. Oh, so we have also um, developed an evaluation survey for this webinar that we'd really appreciate you filling out because as we said we developed this pretty quickly this is our first time doing it and we're hoping to continue to expand this so your feedback on it would be really appreciated it's just a quick survey and it's available via this link um, and then when you do support calls you'll be given a link to a follow-up survey that's again pretty brief but talks about um, or ask has questions about how you use PFA skills in the call And then I think that we can open it up to questions. Okay, so if the people we're talking to are wanting or needing further psychotherapy, is there a resource we can refer them to for help um, identifying providers if we can't see them in our own practice? So who wants to take this? So I know we've got Molly on the call. Molly, are you willing to weigh in about that? Because I think that's part of um, a COVID um, peer group, peer support uh, question. Yes, thank you. So um, can you all hear me? Yes. 
Oh, good. Okay. Um, yeah, so we are trying to build that out and looking at what resources are available for folks. So um, you're welcome to, to ping me directly if you have questions about where that stands. And as soon as something more formal is available, we will be getting that information out. We've been incredibly um, grateful to our community for the outreach they've made to us in terms of community-based providers wanting to help and support. And so we're just working through the logistics of how to engage them. So yes. Thank you, Molly. What other questions are there? So the, the, I saw a question about when calls are beginning, and I'm not sure if that's about um, uh, support calls beginning, um, or if that's also a question about the consult office hour, but the consult office hour will start uh, this coming Monday. Uh, support calls, uh, Molly has already started them, and so Molly will be in touch as far as I understand, and Molly weigh in here, um, if and when somebody's schedule lines up with what the needs are. Yeah, so we um, have already been taking the calls and scheduling folks with volunteers, and I'm trying to keep track of folks who might have ongoing needs as our volunteers get back to us. Um, I noticed that Shelly Weichman chimed in as well on the chat and talked about employee assistance program, which is absolutely a resource for folks, and we've been working directly with them to see how we might be a little more responsive in these times of COVID and make that more user-friendly. Um, I'm going to be sending out um, links to the various materials later today for those folks who are not able to attend the webinar, and many of you are on my distribution, so you may see some of that information, um, but if other folks need to reach me, um, I guess the best way to do that is probably on the department site. I'm listed on the department site. Um, or my email is mgforr at uw.edu. And one last thing that occurs to me just to let the group know in terms of resources that are gonna be coming. Um, uh, Michelle, Emily, and I are also gonna be working on developing materials related to skills for psychological recovery. And that's a brief behavioral intervention that's also modular and flexible. But instead of being on that early tip of the spear, we're really talking about building resilience and restoring coping and functioning. This is kind of a little bit later in the cycle where the person is still having distress and the distress is impacting and interfering, but we're not necessarily talking about true psychopathology to be able to help people build skills, build resources, and something that could happen in like one to six uh, sessions as a framework for that. So that'll be coming over the next few weeks. Um, and absolutely, um, this is a group that we'll be reaching out to, to say, hey, do you wanna um, get trained up in this, learn a little bit more about this, and something that you might be able to apply going forward. Michelle, is there anything else uh, that would be helpful for us to mention before? I don't think so. Have we had any other questions come in to address? I haven't been monitoring. We don't have any other questions. Just wanting to emphasize that the infographics and other materials, the link for those will be sent out by Molly, I believe, later. Um, and they're available on the psychiatry.uw.edu website. Um, there's a special page for COVID-19 resources that I put the, I, I sent the link out via the chat and it'll also go out via email. Um, and the links are also here. So the psychiatry department website link that's under UW support specific resources here will also take you to all of those infographics um, and the two pager and all that stuff. <clears throat> and then the COVID support program link as well. Um, for those of you who are involved in that, Molly's gonna put those materials there as well if she hasn't already. So, um, so we are happy to stick around for any other questions. Um, we are certainly happy and would love company on our office hour, so on Monday mornings. So if people have um, things that they want to address more on an individual basis, we are very willing um, to be a resource in that way. And we hope that if it's helpful to you, you'll take advantage of it. Um, I mean, I think 
the goal is really to think about how we can support our community, right? And, um, you know, I want to emphasize that um, for me, at least, I feel like uh, doing this work is actually building my own resilience. I think being, you, you know, useful <laughs> in a time where it feels like things aren't making sense and things are really crazy and there's chaos all around us and fear and anxiety and sadness, um, you know, being able to contribute in this way. And I imagine that's what motivates a lot of you to do these calls and to volunteer your time and to attend this webinar and all those things as well. And so I think it just really speaks to community resilience and how, you know, building the meaning in this way is, is so useful in all of us moving forward. And so um, I really appreciate the opportunity to be involved in it. I really appreciate all of you for being involved in it. Um, and I think, you know, if we can, if, yeah, if we can keep supporting each other in this way, we are going to move forward. We all are. Um, and I feel hopeful about that. So thank you, everyone, for all the work you're doing. Thank you for being here. Um, very last minute, giving up your lunch hour on a Friday. Um, and thank you for, for taking good care of our community. And make sure you're taking care of yourself. <laughs> yes, that too. <laughs> If there's no other questions or comments. Then I think we're gonna wrap up. I'm gonna turn the recording off at this time and say thank you again.